Good afternoon and welcome to the first episode of the alumni talk show of Army Institute of Management and Technology. Adding a quintessence to the moment we have with us, an alumna from the pioneer batch of AIMT, Aziz Aluwalia of MBA1, Senior Manager, AVP at Deloitte. <laughs> Ma'am has been working with Deloitte for over nine years and is designated as a Senior Manager, AVP for the past one year. She has also held a prominent position of Assistant Manager, Learning and Development for a top-notch firm, Videocon and had also worked as a training consultant in the Keystone Consultants for a year. She would also be presiding over the session and edify us more about the world of human resource. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you to the show, ma'am. Before starting the session, ma'am, how does it feel when you hear these words, Asis Aluwalia of MBA1 after all these years? It feels wonderful. Thank you so much for having me and uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, kind words of introduction. Uh, yeah, AIMT, just listening to the words brings back so many wonderful memories and I cannot wait for, uh, you know, the interaction with all of you all today. So ma'am, we say that we learn something each day to become a better version of ourselves. So if you look back, how would you describe yourself prior to your MBA? <laughs> Um, I was a person uh, with uh, with a mind of my own. Uh, so before we go into this, I must tell everybody all of this is very impromptu. So you might see me take moments of, uh, you know, thoughtfulness uh, and just thinking about what I'm going to say, because all of this, we wanted to keep it very spontaneous and impromptu. Sure, sure. Uh, so me growing up, uh, I was a very independent minded person uh, from the very start. I had a mind of my own. I was uh, very strong willed and uh, stubborn at the same time. Um, of course, like all of us, I grew up uh, in an army family. My father was uh, in the artillery. My mother was a school teacher uh, and I have one older sister. So being the youngest person in the house, I was naturally very, very pampered as well. <laughs> and I grew up uh, with a lot of uh, attention and uh, a lot of love. I think one thing that my parents did really well is even though my sister and I, we were both girls, uh, they never treated us any different from boys. Uh, they never made us feel like, oh, you are girls or if it's something different. It was only much later that we realized like what the world out there uh, does in terms of differentiation between boys and girls and men and women. So in our head, in our world, in our uh, bubble of army life, uh, we just grew up as one. Um, you know, we went out, did cycling. Uh, we didn't have too many restrictions. Luckily, my parents were very, very open minded. Uh, so they never put too many restrictions on us. Uh, they, of course, wanted to ensure uh, safety for us. Uh, so they, my parents did want to know where I was uh, and I never found the need to lie to them. Uh, so I always told them exactly where I was, what I was doing um, and I could come, you know, seven, eight, whatever time uh, I wanted to after playing. So had a really wonderful childhood, I would say. Um, not too many rough patches, um, had a very protected and a very nice, wonderful life. Um, and luckily, uh, unlike most uh, army kids, uh, I know all of us change a lot of schools, uh, but I only changed five schools, which isn't much in the army world. Uh, so in this group, I'm probably like one of those with lesser disruptions, although my civilian friends would feel five schools is a lot uh, to change as well. Um, let me pause here and see if you would like me uh, like me to talk a little bit more about any particular aspect or um, does that, that answer? Good. That is a good one. So, what made you choose MBA and that too from AIMT? Hmm, interesting question. Uh, so, um, <laughs> you know, nothing in my life went uh, as per planning, uh, which is uh, very different from what everybody coming to an MBA school would be telling you. Everyone will be telling you plan this, do this, do that. Uh, for me, uh, everything was quite different from what I would have envisioned or wanted. I think back in school, I probably wanted to be a Montessori school teacher. 
which clearly I'm not. <laughs> so it, it was different from what I planned. Um, and I ended up doing economics honors from Miranda House Delhi University. So that was the first time when things went different from what I planned uh, initially. Uh, I it was a wonderful time, a wonderful subject. Uh, you know, studying at Delhi University exposed me to a lot of different things. Uh, I was very active in my debating society and also the theater society, uh, which helped me a lot. It helped me in terms of my networking skills. It helped me in terms of, uh, you know, being able to articulate my opinion uh, and disagree from audiences very comfortably. Um, after I did my economics honors, uh, I did want to do MBA, but at that point of time, I wanted to work for a year uh, and then do my MBA, but it was very different from what my uh, father wanted me to do. <laughs> uh, he heard about AIMT. I did not know about it at the time. And naturally, because we were the first, uh, you know, the pioneer batch, so it was a brand new institute. Mm -hmm. The wonderful building that you see in the background wasn't really there. <laughs> some parts, <laughs> some yes. parts of it were there, but not all of it. Uh, some of these pillars were there, like of the even the main entrance actually came up a little bit later. Uh, we did have the academic block where we would have our classes. Uh, so anyway, uh, long story short, uh, when he asked me what I wanted to do, uh, I and I shared my plan with him, he wasn't very happy and he told me, you know, there's a new army institute only for wards of army personnel. Why don't you just go take the entrance exam? Uh, and he said, if you don't want to join it later, don't join it, but just take the entrance. So that's how I gave the entrance exam for it. Uh, and uh, that got cleared. Once that got cleared, he was like, why don't you go for the interview? I said, but when I'm not going to join, what's the point? And he said, just get some experience and exposure because that will anyway help you whenever you want to do it. So I went for it. It went well uh, and then I got a call for it. And by then I had completed my uh, undergrad as well uh, or my uh, BA economics. Uh, so then he was like, why don't you just join the Institute? Uh, and so that's how I came to uh, go to AIMT and I'm so fortunate to have been part of the Pioneer Batch uh, because in many ways uh, I feel like it helped us, right? There wasn't somebody there to hold our hands and lead us onto a path. There wasn't anyone to tell us, you know, here's where you can intern. There wasn't anyone who uh, we didn't know which companies would come for placement. So it was a lot of stuff of us going out there, us making calls, us making presentations that here's a college uh, and you know a name that nobody knew, nobody recognized, nobody was aware of. Um, so I think all of those things ultimately now when I look back uh, really helped us. Um, it might have seemed really tough, on some days we might have had fear whether we made the right decision or we didn't. Uh, we had days when we wondered whether we will land any internship or not. So all those sleepless nights I think made us stronger, made us more determined, help us uh, you know, navigate uncharted territory and create our own path. And I think that in itself is a very unique experience that we wouldn't have got uh, if we went to any other college, right? Where there were already people who had been there, done that, we wouldn't have had the chance to navigate and create our own path. So I feel very blessed and fortunate uh, to have had that opportunity and that wonderful experience of, uh, you know, uh, being uh, in a brand new college where the construction is happening in front of us, the faculty, uh, is also getting, uh, you know, sometimes hired, sometimes leaving in front of us and all of those teething troubles. I think they made us much stronger, much better. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate it now when we look back. Yes, ma'am. So how important is MBA to survive in such an everlasting competitive world? <laughs> hmm. Uh, 
I'll give you an honest answer. It may not be the answer that everybody wants you to hear, but this is my perspective. Uh, I think MBA is, uh, or any degree for that matter, I would say, is a chance uh, that helps you in many ways, right? There is a personal aspect and there's a professional aspect. The professional aspect is definitely, you know, the curriculum that you go through, uh, the job that search that you, the process of job search that you go through, right? All of that that teaches you something about, you know, what is it that recruit that companies are looking for? What is it that you need to learn, grow, be able to speak? What is the expertise that you can develop? So all of that aspect is one. Uh, and then the second aspect uh, that any education institute would teach you is uh, the softer skills or your personal aspect, right? Uh, how do you deal with others? Are you able to have, um, a, you know, disagreements informally in your social group? Uh, how are you able to influence and communicate with others? Uh, are you able to lead a group and take them, you know, where you want them to? Say, for example, you have an idea. I want to create a debating society in my college. Are you able to go make that pitch to the management? Are you able to go and inspire those students and form that society? Are you able to envision and come up with a plan of activities that that society will need? Uh, to stay active uh, and then you know how do you participate in debates outside the college? Uh, how do you take it to the next level and things like that as you will sit down and do those other things uh, or as you create even a group of friends uh, whom you help in their tough times, maybe you teach them a night before the exam, uh, maybe you help clear a concept they've not understood. Uh, or you just hang out with them over the weekend just to get some downtime or, you know, unwind. When you do all those things, you are building your softer skills. You might be building your leadership skills. You might be building your professional skills. You might be learning how to communicate. Uh, you might be learning or doing something without even knowing that you are learning or doing something. And I think that for me, is like the most invaluable uh, learning that you have in any educational institute, which is going to be so, so important for you and carry you through your entire uh, professional life, regardless of what you do. Okay. In today's world, given the disruption that's happening in the space of technology and a lot of other things, I think MBA alone per se uh, is not maybe that sufficient in itself. It may not be that uh, like maybe 20 years ago, if somebody said I'm an MBA, you know, people needed people to do management and administration, those kind of jobs. There was a lot of need for those. Today, if you ask me, there is definitely a need for those jobs, but there is also a need for a lot of added additional skills uh, which you can pursue in addition to your MBA. Uh, so I do think MBA is important uh, for all the reasons just stated. Is it sufficient by itself? I'm not sure you might still be lucky and get what you want with just the MBA, uh, but there will be an increasing need as as time keeps passing for you to stay current relevant uh, and make sure that you don't get redundant in this extremely fast moving pace of world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And what according to you was the best thing about the college and also was this something that you think that could have been better? <laughs> the best thing about the college, there were so many best things. Um, I think I alluded to some about, you know, us being the first batch and us getting an opportunity to uh, navigate and create our own path and be pioneers in our own way. I think that was definitely wonderful. I think my most wonderful memories, though, are in the hostel. Uh, we had a lot of fun in the hostel. Um, 
and for me actually those are some of my most memorable moments um we used to stay up late at night talking and uh, doing a lot of things there used to be times when we would be making presentations practicing how our pitches are going to be for corporates you know going in vans and that time you know greater noida was not so developed as it is today uh, there wasn't even um, like any public transport to get to greater noida at all uh, there was not even the metro in those days to noida uh so uh, noida getting to noida itself was a big thing and getting from noida to greater noida was a <laughs> unimaginable thing so a lot of those treks of getting to college are also part of my most memorable moments <laughs> uh, and then uh, i think my, uh, uh, so my first year of aimt is filled with a lot of those fun memories uh of uh, you know spending time making friends uh having fights and all of that uh, my second year is also very special uh because it gave me a completely different exposure and i'm not sure if i should be saying it maybe i should have clarified in advance i started working while i was uh studying uh at that point of time there was a exception to the rule that was made i'm not sure if it's not allowed please do not uh this is by no means to um motivate you to break any rules <laughs> please do follow whatever other norms currently uh but i was lucky i started working uh in the month of feb uh so all through feb till uh, our exams which were i think in the month of may june um i was studying and working uh which was uh, at that time extremely exciting for me because we were so eager to go out there get into the corporate world know what happens in an office and you know do our first projects and all of that and give our first deliverables uh so i feel very very fortunate uh, to do that and there was an exception made for me at that point of time i don't know what the rules are now of course right now everything's virtual so maybe <laughs> i can share quite frankly uh, i uh, there was an exception made for me to be able to also keep my car on campus which was not something which was allowed at the time um and uh, just to allow me to safely commute because greater noida of course used to get very dark and we didn't have street lights and things like that so just keeping safety in mind um they did allow me to keep the car and i felt very privileged of course on campus because i was the only one who could do that <laughs> i have also done my boarding you know for the past 12 years i've been the boarder in nainital shewood college for the past 12 years so now i do know the feeling of a you know boarding school or even for a hostel that for the matter of fact that yeah. actually pleasure <laughs> yeah I, and I think I've shared this earlier also with the uh, group, and and um, pardon me if I'm repeating myself. We used to have like one hostel for boys and girls, so one floor was just girls, the first floor, where the warden also used to be the girl ladies warden, and then uh, the gentlemen were on the floor above, uh, and then you know how we have that center area which is all open. with the lobby uh, running all around it so if you came out to the lobby pretty much you could talk across different floors and things like that uh, so yeah we used to have a lot of fun and uh, it was very very interesting times this was only for the first year though uh, and then the ladies hostel got made uh, and then uh, of course we had separate uh, units which was also really good because we i think had had enough of each other by then <laughs> <laughs> Um, moving on ma'am um, how did amt prepare you for your career in human resource and what role did it play to shape you to become who I, who you are today amt played a huge role in my hr career because uh, my internship was in hbcl uh, in a wonderful project my project was how to exceed expectations of internal customers and uh, just imagine this was like around 15 years ago right um and this was not a topic people used to think about a lot in companies back then so i got the opportunity to do this very exciting project uh in one of the navratnas that was doing exceedingly well at the time uh so 
excellent exposure there. Uh, Shruti ma'am was uh, our teacher and she was a wonderful, wonderful teacher. So definitely all the knowledge from her was very, very helpful in terms of shaping our HR knowledge base. Uh, and then I got placed in Relegare Securities, which was my first job uh, from campus. Uh, and it happened uh, because they came to recruit people for marketing. Uh, and we were just helping them and uh, in just a passing conversation, we happened to ask the head of HR who had come to recruit marketing folks. Uh, Ma'am, do you have openings for HR? And uh, she had opening for one person and I feel so lucky and fortunate that I got that opportunity then. And uh, Relegare at the time was going through a very interesting growth phase. Uh, they were rapidly expanding. So you can imagine they were scaling up from 200, 400 people to 2,400 people. So that kind of transformation where the growth is like phenomenal. So I got to do a lot of interesting projects. One was around competency mapping, uh, where I had to, uh, you know, uh, create job descriptions from the most junior level to the most senior level in the organization, interview people, understand what their jobs are, articulate it, come up with what skills are required, what competencies really are key to the success uh, of those positions. I got to do a little bit of acquisition. I got to do a little bit of organizational development. So it was like a dream job and the projects that I did there. Uh, unfortunately, it was a very short stint for me. It was only about six, seven months uh, because then I moved to the United States and everything that I did in Relegare helped me to get my first job in the US. Uh, so it, so my job was because of AIMT and my US job was also because of that experience. So I think AIMT played a crucial role in my career. If it wasn't for uh, everything that I learned in the college, if it wasn't for the degree that we got from there, I wouldn't be where I am today. Ma'am, so which trends and benefits are you excited about and why? And also, what trends do you hope to see in future? Like, you know, it could be anything, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Your knowledge, ma'am, or anything, ma'am. So there are a lot of trends which are unique, new and exciting in the space of HR these days. Um, I think it's it's a time of tremendous disruption that's happening, accelerated by COVID. It was anyway coming. It's just got uh, everything that we were thinking was going to be the future has become like the present and I think in some ways even the past given that we've already spent like one year in these times. Uh, so in the field of learning, if you look at it, uh, everything's being digitized. No longer are we doing any classroom trainings. It's been a whole year. We've not have we've not had a single person step foot in a classroom, which is completely different from what any L&D professional had been doing like three years ago. All of us used to be, you know, facilitators, thinking about the whole experience. And uh, in fact, I was the program manager in Deloitte for one of our most marquee milestone programs, most leading edge, uh, which used to be like a complete Broadway production of sorts. Uh, and from there, we are now doing everything digitally. So it is a complete change of mindset altogether, right? Uh, and it's a complete change of environment. But I think more than anything, it's a change of the mindset uh, which has been accelerated thanks to COVID. Uh, it's helped people be more open uh, to consuming things digitally even when you know they used to uh, detest it. And that uh, was this, this era is called the industrial 4.0 era. That's that right. <laughs> that's that right. Is. It's industry 4.0. And what we've done for our uh, learners is we've created like a portal, uh, which is like the Netflix or Amazon of learning, if you will, 
Uh, so we've uh, got a vendor to design a portal for us, which will have um, a lot of different learning currently in Deloitte. Like the biggest challenge in learning is not the availability of right resources, but just knowing where to consume what, because there are so many things in so many places and it's hard to know where what is there. So this tool firstly has helped us aggregate a lot of different mediums of uh, learning. And then after that, it helps understand what your individual pattern of learning is. Uh, what, what are the sort of things you are enjoying reading? What are the sort of videos you are enjoying watching? Uh, and according to your preferences, it starts throwing up things uh, in your feed uh, bases, your preferences, and you also have an opportunity to select a few preferences. You can also follow different people uh, and see what is it that they are learning? How is it that they are rating the things that they are learning? Uh, so if I am influenced by you, Siddhant, for example, uh, and I, I am curious to know what is it that you are consuming? How is it that you are learning? Uh, I have the opportunity to actually very openly have a look at what you are doing and also learn uh, some of those same things. And I can follow multiple people uh, and you know learn from them so I can uh, be inspired and learn from my mentors. There are a lot of other things which are happening which we don't currently have. Uh, things like when you're consuming learning, uh, not just uh, your, uh, uh, you know, you don't just have to wait to end the program and then rate how your experience of learning that was to know how good or bad it is, but just by the cameras that are there on the laptop. They examine the pupils uh, and how your expressions change when you're watching a particular video or reading a particular book or consuming a particular learning, and it assesses whether you are enjoying this or not enjoying it and bases that preference also over time. It starts throwing you things uh, that you, you biologically tend to react better to or understand better. Uh, so, you know, those are also changes that are happening. True, true. Another thing that's happening for us is the world of coaching is changing tremendously. Uh, and earlier we never used digital platforms for coaching. Today we are using a lot of digital platforms for coaching. So if there are people here who are interested, uh, Decreed is a really good vendor. You should go check out their website and lead, uh, read about the kind of things that they are doing out there in the industry. Very leading edge. Better Up is another coaching platform which is doing exceedingly well and is going to go phenomenally. Yesterday I was reading a news article around it. Let me see if I can pull that up. That talks about how uh, better up is going to be turning from a million dollar uh, company to a billion dollar company in a very short uh, time. Anyway, I'll see if I can pull that up and I'll put the link over here. Uh, also very interesting. Um, what else is changing in the space of HR? HR is, um, I think the biggest change that's happening is uh, learning is becoming learner led instead of facilitator led. That's trend number one. Uh, trend number two, if I can say, is uh, digitizing of everything um, from uh, your learning platforms to how you are reacting. So your evaluation and you know things like that also are going to become digital. In the future, you will also see just to extend the point on digitization. So if your outlook it has certain keywords, right? Like you're working on a certain proposal for a company uh, where you're trying to pitch for uh, say a new performance management system and things like that. Uh, the learning system decreed is going to be so smart that it will pick up those words from your outlook and start throwing you things that might be useful to you given your pattern of work in outlook. Uh, so I'm not sure how much uh, you all use outlook right now, but it's like the Gmail at work. Uh, so all your emails uh, come to MS outlook uh, and uh, the. 
a key there is going to be for uh, the technology to be able to sense uh, what is it that you need even before you can actually think about it. Uh, the next trend that I can think of is um, a lot of data driven decisions. Uh, in HR, I don't think we used to do a lot of data driven decisions, uh, but now given all the disruptions that are happening, there is an increasing need uh, whether we talk of employee engagement, whether we talk of performance evaluation, whether we talk of learning and development, there is an increasing need for leaders to look at data that reflects employees' behaviors and take actions based the data that throws up, that comes up from there. Uh, so these are some of the key trends that I can think of right now uh, that are disrupting the workplace. What was the second part of your question? I'm like, what trends do you see? What trends yes. do you see yes, in future yeah. ma'am or in some the same domain? Yes, yeah, these are some of the trends that I see and I think increasingly it's going to be less labor intensive and more technology dependent um, as I envision it going from here. The, uh, for example, the role of as more and more things get digitized, fewer and fewer people will be needed um, to do a lot of things that used to be heavily, you know, person led in the past that we were typically used to seeing a person doing. There are also a lot of bots that can answer a lot of queries and questions uh, that also helps uh, reduce the number of people that are needed for interactions, right? Um, so I think constantly uh, looking at things that are around you constantly being aware are very, very key. I think there's a great blog at Udemy that releases trends every year. If you don't already read that, I would highly recommend uh, for you to read it. It tells what are the top 10 skills uh, that are expected from the year, what are the things that are changing, uh, and it gives an industry by industry analysis as well. So if you have a particular interest, say for example, in automotive industry, uh, you can go look it up as well. Uh, so it's a great blog that uh, I find very helpful. And can you guess what was the number one skill set uh, that they said is uh, the need of the hour in this year? Anyone? Uh, I, I actually I can't see anyone else over here. Is there a way for me to see? Um, and there are only actually four of us, I guess. Oh, that's it. Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, this will be going. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what happened? How come just four? Ma actually, the classes oh. have you know collided with the uh, talk show also. Oh no! We Not should have come at a different time. Oh. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, it's it's more like it's a interview uh, with you. So uh, Siddhan would be taking it, and then we will be releasing on the platform. So it's more like a face-to-face -face thing. Okay, so one to one conversation, ma'am, and then we can also post it in the social media. That it's more like it's uh, like like we used to do webinars. That's a different uh, thing. This oh, time okay. they have started a new initiative with the new batch. So we are taking that forward. It's more like a, uh, you know, having a alumni and then you know, taking their uh, memories and learning from that. Got it, got it. Yeah, no, so fantastic. So I'll answer. I don't want to put any of you on the spot. Uh, the number one skill set that they uh, said that needed to be developed was a growth mindset. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have read this book called On Mindset. It's by Carol Dweck. Let me see if I have it here. Uh, no, I don't have it here, but it's by Carol Dweck. If you get a chance, please read it uh, and I can share the name uh, with you all after this conversation so that you can put it in the comments as well for everybody. So ma'am, ma'am, how do you handle coaching or firing employees or even the policy enforcement. How do you handle all this as an HR? When you say policy enforcement, explain that to me. Ma'am, like anything like, uh, for example, a theft in the uh, the firm or something. How do you enforce it, ma'am? 
It could be anything. Yeah. Man. The policy, basically, the you set for the firm, firm, especially. Yeah, for compliance, right? So for compliance, we have a number of uh, things that we do. One is we have a certain set of mandatory trainings that everybody has to go through. And uh, some of our best trainings are actually designed uh, by vendors for specifically that list to make those drop topics uh, less uh, dry and boring for the people. So that's one. Uh, the other thing that we do, we have in our organization is something called the integrity helpline. So it's a place where people can call and uh, log their complaints. Uh, and if they want to reveal their identity, they can. If they want to stay anonymous, they can. Uh, after that, there is an investigation that is done uh, by our talent relations team uh, just to find out uh, whether the complaint that was made was valid or not. It could be about theft. It could be about harassment. It could be about uh, unfair. Um, uh, if somebody feels uh, excluded or discriminatory remarks are made against someone, somebody is not feeling included in a team uh, or you know anything uh, that could be bothersome to any of the employees. Once that investigation concludes, uh, depending upon the findings of the investigation, uh, we have appropriate actions which could range from um, say if the complaint was found to be true and there was a trend, historical trend that was observed, uh, then of course a very strict action would be taken, uh, which could even mean uh, having that person leave the organization. Uh, if it is a very minor thing uh, and it's found to be true and it seems like it was only a one off case and doesn't regularly happen, then that person is called in and uh, is given a, you know, we have a coaching conversation with that person. We try to understand what triggered that behavior, what made that person react in that manner or make those comments that made the other person uncomfortable. Uh, and after that, um, if, if, if there's a repetition of the same behavior, then it could lead to a next level of escalation. Of course, the final level of escalation is termination. So depending on what happened and what is the right level of uh, action that needs to be taken by the firm that is taken. And under all these conditions, uh, the person who makes the complaint, uh, his identity is definitely not revealed. Uh, just to avoid uh, the risk of retaliation uh, from the person who might have made, uh, uh, might have been uh, the object of investigation uh, so that there are no repercussions to that person. And we take retaliation very seriously. If anybody retaliates, uh, then there is very, very strict action taken against them. Uh, and for our, uh, like, uh, partners and managing directors, there is a separate team uh, called Partner Matters uh, that takes it into its own hands uh, and there can be only a certain level of escalation, so number of escalations that can happen against a partner or director uh, before they are asked to actually leave the firm. Okay. So ma'am, what has been the most challenging aspect of human resource and how do you tackle that? Or how do you handle this? Most challenging aspect. Um, I think for me, the most challenging aspect was uh, when I was a learning consultant with the strategy and operations group. Uh, so the strategy and operations team of uh, Deloitte is like the creme de la creme of Deloitte. Uh, They're all tier one institute graduates. They are all type A personalities extremely high performing group, extremely articulate um, and very, very good in what they do. And this is the group that interacts with all the CXOs of different organizations across the world. Uh, so naturally, you know, the experiences and exposures they have uh, is very different from, um, you know, what you would see in a lot of other groups. So when I became the learning consultant or the learning partner with that group, um, I faced a lot of different challenges. First was, uh, you know, I I was already at a manager level then, so I had a certain style and way of working. 
uh, and then to come in between in a group and adapt to their culture. Second, establish my credibility. Uh, third, push forward on what we thought was the right thing for them in terms of their learning plans. Um, you know, some of those things were very, very challenging. Just navigating that group was extremely challenging uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, I think it was uh, <laughs> it was also very, very enriching and also very, very exciting because that group was so good. Whether you go interact with the analyst, which is like the entry level position, or you go interact with a partner or director in that group, you always come back learning something. Um, the conversations are at a different level. Uh, the conversations are so focused on performance. Uh, it's a lean, mean, efficient team uh, kind of a group. Uh, of high performers, so you're constantly on your toes, always reading and finding out what's out there, what's best in the industry, making sure uh, you know you are up to date on top of your toes and know everything uh, because that group is so smart. They can just turn around and challenge you uh, and feel like they know everything. Um, how did I deal with it or tackle? Uh, I think for me, the most important thing was being authentic. Uh, so what I knew, I knew what I didn't know, I didn't know, and I never hesitated to uh, be very clear about it. Uh, I always made sure if I did not have the answer to something, I went back, uh, did my research and did close the loop on it. Uh, and I think that's what uh, everybody appreciated uh, that uh, I think I was I can tell one thing for sure. I may not be the smartest person, but I'm definitely the most hardworking person on my team. Uh, so if there's anything that uh, that is a shortfall, I can make up uh, with my hard work <laughs> on that front. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, how do you ensure that you are hiring and retaining top employees? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, not always the easiest thing to do. And what we realized in Deloitte was our challenge was that we took a lot of top performers from outside and got them into it, got them into Deloitte. Naturally, we have like all really good performers. And then earlier we used to have this bell curve rating system which used to force a lot of our employees, about 70% of our employees into feeling that they are just average. Uh, and so the first thing that we did was um, about seven to eight years ago, we did away with the bell curve rating or force fitting people into stack ranking uh, team members. I think that was one of the best things we've done. And we aligned our whole performance management system to a strengths based philosophy where people were encouraged to take on work that is more aligned to their strengths uh, and strengths, not necessarily things that they are good at today, but things that they are energized by that they enjoy doing because the more time they will spend on it, the more uh, their performance is going to accelerate as opposed to spending time on doing a ton of things that just drain you out by the end of the day. Uh, we wanted people to spend more time and more energy into things that excite them uh, because that's how they are going to perform better and uh, you know give exponential results to the organization. So this is one thing that we did at an organization wide level. And to do this one thing alone took a ton of different efforts. It needed our team leaders to understand the concept of strengths better. It needed people to think about evaluation in a different way and not have to forcefully stack rank uh, professionals. So uh, if we have pockets of high performance in the uh, organization, the those should be all high performing people. Otherwise, what tended to happen was people would get um, at the end of performance evaluation, people would get demoralized. They would quit the organization. They would go out and most of them 
uh, we did a survey actually and realized that about 80 to 90 percent of them switched firms and got promotions that they did not get here uh, because they were such high performers. So we realized that we need to reward and recognize our people better uh, to be able to retain them. Uh, and you know, if if they are worth uh, more, uh, then they must be valued in the current organization rather than making them quit. What else do we do for creating a culture of high performance? I think the biggest strength of Deloitte is in its culture. Um, and we do a lot of uh, we have a lot of policies that encourage a culture of high performance. Um, a lot of it also, I would say, depends on uh, the leader of the practice because from there it trickles down to the entire practice. Uh, and uh, I think one is monetarily rewarding the right si uh, kind of behaviors that we want to encourage in the organization. Um, the other is without the formal uh, reward and recognition, you know, applauses and things like that. Creating such an atmosphere that people find it hard to leave the people that they work with uh, just because of the enriching conversations that they have, whether with clients, whether with teams, uh, whether through experiences that they can get um, uh, through certain jobs, for example. Uh, I got the opportunity to get interviewed by HBR uh, and get published in one of their articles uh, around performance management, which was taught in one of the semesters as well at Howard. Uh, so those kind of experiences and exposures, uh, no amount of money can buy for you, right? So we create the right kind of experiences and exposures and put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, to create that holistic development for our employees and create a sustainable level of high performance for our professionals. We also try to encourage uh, people to, uh, to get the right kind of learning that they need uh, to get to the next level. Uh, so for example, in Audible, we have a contract with them whereby our employees, uh, at least all of our consulting employees, have access to a ton of books uh, on specific topics that would be very, very helpful to them uh, under technology, under uh, under disruption, under analytics, under communication, under leadership and things like that as well. Um, so uh, yeah, we just create a very, very employee friendly atmosphere that helps create that level of engagement for our people that pushes them, uh, that pushes our, encourages our high performers to, you know, tend to stay with us longer. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, what are the factors or points one should consider while choosing the HR specialization? Um, that's a really good question. I think one thing you should think about is whether you are genuinely interested in making others successful. Because really the job of HR is to make everybody successful in the firm, right? The right person at the right job at the right time uh, is what you need to create and understand, right? So you have to have a genuine interest in putting others before yourself and thinking about the organization at a large level. The second thing I would say is if you enjoy, you must be a person who enjoys reading because as a HR person, you will be interacting with people, uh, you know, it depends on which industry you are part of. It depends on so many things. You know, you'll be working with a variety of different industries over the course of your career. So if you tend to read a lot, you will have greater exposure uh, and a better ability to connect with a variety of people. I think that's really important as an HR professional. So you must enjoy that genuinely. Otherwise, you will struggle after a particular point 
to be able to showcase yourself. Uh, the third thing I would say is if you are considering HR, please do not think that it's a nine to five job. A lot of people I know in MBA, <laughs> we don't like to talk about these things, but end up thinking of HR that, oh, you know what? I want to have a good work life balance. Uh, and so let me take HR because most HR professionals, I think, have a nine to five job. I will tell you in my entire career, the only time I had a nine to five job was when I was working in a non HR uh, <laughs> uh, work profile. Okay. So none of my other HR job profiles had a nine to five job, uh, primarily because uh, most organizations are understaffed when it comes to HR uh, because it's a support function. So naturally people tend to understaff it and uh, so the few people that are there end up working uh, longer hours to compensate for more people. Uh, of course, this is not uh, like every single organization. You will find uh, roles which are nine to five as well, but do not keep that as your uh, criteria for choosing the subject. Sure. Yeah, and and lastly, I would say like you, uh, you know, you you should be triggered uh, by the thought about how can I make benefits more exciting? How can I make uh, learning more exciting for people? How can I make, um, how can I create culture of high performance where I am? If these are the sort of questions that come to your mind, if these are the sort of questions you seek answers for in books, uh, how can we motivate professionals? Money is not really a motivating criteria really. Right. So if you understand some of those things, if those problems excite you, uh, then HR is the field for you. Ma'am, what according to you matters the most while sitting in for placements or internship interviews for the human resource domain? Hmm. I think the thing that matters the most is your attitude and um, you know the softer aspects of your personality uh, because everything else can probably be learned uh, but your ability to fit into the culture of the organization your ability to fit into the team that they are recruiting for is really what most organizations are looking for so people are looking for people who have a lot of grit a lot of determination people who have perseverance people who uh, like to solve problems uh, because that's what they are trying to do themselves and somebody who is eager to learn and is not waiting to be spoon fed, right? Uh, if somebody wants that, you know, I'm here, I'm willing to do everything. Please tell me what I need to, uh, you know, I'm sitting here. Can you, uh, you know, pick up the spoon and put the food in my mouth? Sorry, that's not very helpful. Uh, a lot of people can do that. There's nothing new or exciting about you uh, for that, right? You are not needed for that. However, if you are the type who will say, hey, I don't know how to do that, but I'm willing to go out there and teach myself how I can do that and then get back to you uh, with results. So that is something that kind of go getter attitude uh, is what will help you and distinguish you from the other candidates that are applying. Ma'am, so it's a follow up question, ma'am. If you're appointed for recruiting at AIMT, what personality traits would you be looking for in a student? Yeah, I think I sort of answered that in the previous uh, comment, uh, but in addition to what I already said, what I would look for is good communication skills. Uh, I would look for somebody who can work in a team, uh, can be collaborative, uh, can articulate his or her point of view, must have a point of view first uh, and then be able to articulate. I would love to see somebody who can walk in the other person's shoes as well. Uh, so, you know, anticipate what my organization is, what challenges is it going through, what is it that you 
can do to add value to my organization. If somebody can think of those things before the interview and then come and have a conversation, I think I would be stunned. So ma'am, what are the career prospects in the field of human resource where the students can start from? And also what kind of certifications are required for the same? Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of different job profiles within HR. Um, and it depends from organization to organization. There are some smaller organizations that have smaller teams, so there might be different people doing multiple roles uh, without having se separate departments for each of those. Uh, and then you could be in a large organization, right? Uh, which will have very, very specialized uh, different teams for different things. So there are some core aspects of HR. The, uh, you know, the top of the chain, if I may say so, is the role of a HR business partner uh, or you know it goes by different names in different firms uh, in Deloitte for example it's called the talent business advisory team this is a really nice role uh, that has a complete overview of all different aspects of HR uh, this role must have good understanding of what is it that the business does how is it that they earn revenue? What is it that uh, what are their challenges and how can we help create a culture of high performance? How can we evaluate our professionals really well? How can we reward and recognize them well? Right, so all of those things sort of roll up into this HR business partner. And as the role, role suggests, uh, this person is truly a partner to business from an HR aspect in all aspects. The other aspect which is really important in HR is recruitment acquisition, right? Understanding what are what is it that business does? What are the sort of roles and skills that they need? And how is it that we can help fulfill some of those roles and requirements that exist? Um, it's also a very coveted role within HR. Um, then comes learning and development. Uh, I find it personally the most exciting role in HR uh, because you're always looking to improve yourself from wherever you are, right? It also gives you an opportunity to understand yourself. Um, so a lot of for a lot of different reasons, uh, learning is a very exciting role and uh, with it comes, uh, you know, strategizing where the business is today, where it intends to be in the next five years, and what is it that we need to do in terms of learning today to help bridge that gap to where people need to be in the next five years so that we are ahead of the curve and not behind it. Um, there's also, a, uh, you know, comp and benefits, compensation and benefits team that exists within the gamut of HR. Again, a very, very exciting role to be able to understand how compensation works, how is the benchmarking done in the industry to understand where we lie vis-a-vis -vis the benchmarks in that particular industry. Uh, benefits is an amazing field, uh, especially in terms of understanding what is it that we can do to distinguish ourselves from the other organizations that exist. Uh, so a lot of opportunity for people to come up with new and unique things over there as well. Then there is talent relations uh, that we spoke about earlier that helps investigate into a lot of different things. Uh, you know, any issues that employees would be going through, um, they help make sure that they are uh, keeping a tight check on the uh, action that the firm needs to take against individuals or uh, within the firm or even outside the firm as might be appropriate. Um, to ensure the right action. Uh, in addition, uh, there are a lot of other smaller roles. I wouldn't get into all of them, but a lot of operations, logistics, support. Uh, there is also rewards and recognition. Uh, a lot of other things that happen in terms of the back office support also for HR, uh, but largely I think we've covered everything. Thank you. Uh, so 
uh, there was a second aspect to your question, right? What are yes. the roles and? Ma'am, the certifications which are required. Certifications. Okay. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, th there is a PHR and SPHR certification. As a starter, you can look at PHR uh, certification. Uh, but jobs in HR are not really based on what certification you've done. So first get a job and then pick up a certification that might be appropriate for that particular role of HR. Uh, I would say that would be my advice, but if you have time on your hands and if you have uh, the money available, please do uh, look at these certifications. I have done a SAP uh, HCM certification as well uh, from Siemens. Uh, so if that is something that interests you, uh, you can look at that as well. Um, but I will tell you experience counts more than the certification. Uh, so just thinking that, oh, I have the certification and now I can get a job in that field might be a little tough. So be careful because some of these certifications can be quite expensive, uh, especially SAP certifications are very, very expensive. So tread carefully. Uh, if you're really hell-bent, then you can go ahead with the certification first and then try your luck in terms of getting a job as well. Uh, you can always try that too. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, it was indeed a very fruitful conversation and I hope after listening to you, many students will find it easier to find a way to the future. Ma'am, since all the good things come to an end, this episode has also reached to its climax. But before we officially conclude this session, ma'am, would you like to give any piece of advice for the students and the young professionals. Sure, absolutely. I would say that you are in the prime of your life. Make sure you do not waste these next 10, 15 years that you have ahead of you. They are probably going to be some of the most crucial and critical, uh, uh, most critical phase of your life. So make sure you make the most of it. Um, make sure you enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, again, this time is not going to come back. And I would leave you with saying that go out there and make your dent in the universe. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. With this, we come to the end of our first session of Alumni Talks. I would like to thank Ms. Aziz Aluwalia for her precious time and sharing her experience with us. We will be back with another session with another alumnus. Till then, keep working on yourself and keep learning. Thank you.